Well, it's great to see all of you today. I'm so happy you're here. I don't think you look gloomy. I think, I think Pastor Jeff's got a problem. <laughs> we'll work on him, okay? Let me just take a brief moment to give a plug about the Season Saints event Friday night. This will be our last meeting until they resume again in the fall. We've sold 130 tickets plus, but there's still room for more. There's still room for you, and I hope that you'll come Friday night. We have a great time, wonderful food, wonderful fellowship, some great music provided by some very talented, talented musicians, plus me. They let me play with them and, and sing with them. It's, it's, it's amazing the, uh, the uh, grace and the tolerance these people have. Uh, and we have fun, and you will have fun too. So please step right out after the service. Go back to that table and uh, buy your tickets today. They're only $5, and we have a special deal this Sunday, this Sunday only, all day long. You can get two for $10. Yeah, so take it. It's like stealing, isn't it? So take advantage of it. And uh, the age for seniors, I don't know what it is now. You know, it used to be 65, and then they moved it down to 60 and 55. I think it's 35 now. <laughs> if you are 35 years or older, you are more than welcome to come and be a part of Friday night. Look forward to seeing you. All right, turn in your Bibles, please, or look at the overhead in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to uh, just read three verses there, chapter 6, verse 9, 10, and 11. You know, I really try to preach every sermon like it's going to be my last sermon. Uh, at my age, it could be, but uh, I try to approach it with that kind of context, that kind of seriousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. We're going through 1 Corinthians, and uh, there, uh, I mean, I, there's so much in so little time. So much in this chapter that uh, I found almost irresistible, irresistibly appealing, but I, I've settled on these three verses. I think they're so important. Paul says, do you not know and he repeats that phrase several times in writing to the Corinthians. Uh, you'll see it up in verse 2 and verse 3. You'll see it down in verse 15 and 16, verse 19. Do you not know this question that pulls them in, that incorporates them into the conversation? Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul has talked about the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. And by the way, God's wisdom is considered foolishness by the world. So Paul has set the stage for a continuing line of reasoning. The wisdom of the world versus the foolishness of God will be on constant display in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. The wisdom of the world versus the foolishness of God. It's a good thing to keep in mind as you read 1 Corinthians. So there is a tension between the Christian's views and those of the world about what? About almost everything. It's always been that way. You will see it in this letter regarding morality, the way of salvation, marriage, sexual conduct, life after death, and a number of other issues. There is just no meeting of the minds between the world and the Christian. 
at least a Bible-believing Christian. There are two categories of people in our text, this segment of God's wisdom, just two categories. And everyone falls into one of those two categories. The first one is the wicked. Now, that doesn't sit well with us. Something within us resists that notion. We try to do away with those kinds of thoughts. According to the wisdom of the world, the wicked are really not wicked. They're just socially maladjusted. They're just economically deprived. They're, they're inadequately nurtured. And really, it's, it's not their fault. It's, it's our fault. It's society's fault. It's the injustice of an unfair system stacked against them. And we should do everything we can to have a fair and just society, a level playing field, to give everyone a chance to succeed in life. But the problem with man is more than man's environment. It's more than what's around him. It's what's in him. It's his heart. It's man himself. Society loves to teach that man is basically good, and we just need to help him find the good, find the God within him, and to let that good out. And once again, the wisdom of man comes up against the wisdom of God. You will never see the Bible, God's wisdom, talking about man's inherent goodness. Instead, the Bible declares that man, all men, are condemned. There is none righteous, not even one, the Bible says. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And though Paul presents a list of sins here, it's not those individual sins that condemn a person. It's his wicked state. It's his condition out of which those sins flow. Man sins because he's a sinner. It's really that simple. The same Paul writes to Titus, and he reviews how at one time you were foolish, and we thought we were so wise, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Many years ago, and I find the older I get, the more I find myself saying that, many years ago, I had a funeral in Sioux City, Iowa. I, I can't remember whose funeral it was now, but I, I, I do remember that the, 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 the guy was a scoundrel, and everybody knew it. And I knew it, and his family knew it, and the funeral director knew it. The funeral director was a nice man and a man of the church, but his church was one that believed in the basic goodness of humankind, and we're all on our way up, and eventually we'll become so good that we'll usher in the golden age of the millennium. Really, good luck with that one. How does that seem to be working? It's hard to imagine that anyone would maintain that belief because it really flies in the face of everything around us. It's a make-believe world, an altered reality. So on the way to the cemetery, this funeral director was giving me his philosophy of life. He was telling me how education was the answer. And he said, if only this poor man, this scoundrel on his last ride to the cemetery, if only he had been given more education, life would have turned out so much better for him. Education is the answer, he insisted. Really? Have you been on a college campus lately? Have you seen and heard some of the professors and what they're espousing? Some of them are the most liberal lame brains in the country. 
a country, by the way, they despise, that they want to dismantle from top to bottom and rebuild on the order of their favorite socialist country. Now, not all professors, please understand I'm not saying that. My son is a professor, but if I ever heard him say some of this stuff, I'd hug him, I'd put my arm around him, and I'd whisper in his ear, son, you are a lame brain. <laughs> not all, but way too many. Education is no guarantee of enlightenment. Education is wonderful. Get all you can get. But education without a changed heart only leads to better educated criminals. Education doesn't change wicked. Education is important, but it is impotent in changing the human heart. Education without a changed heart you just end up going to a white-collar prison. We're also living in a day when it's increasingly thought, well, everybody's going to heaven. There is no wicked. Everybody's going to heaven. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter how you live. Everybody goes to heaven. And there are preachers who are preaching this message of universalism, that everybody is saved. In fact, some of them even insist that the devil, the devil himself, is going to come around and he's going to get right with God and he's going to repent of his ways and the devil too is going to get saved. And we all go to heaven. And they tell us, well, I just can't imagine a good God sending people to hell. Yes, that's what they imagine, but the Word of God isn't always in keeping with what we imagine. While you say you can't imagine a good God allowing people to go to hell, some of us have trouble imagining a just God allowing the wicked into heaven. The wicked who won't know part of God, who would hate heaven almost as much as hell. So it seems that it doesn't matter what the Bible says in this day. We kind of make this stuff up as we go along. We get to believe what we want to believe. So really, you know, who needs God? Who, who needs the Bible? Who needs the Apostle Paul? Who needs Jesus? Because we've got our own imaginings. It's a wicked day we live in. We need the truth of God's Word. We need the wisdom of God to navigate through the, the minefield of deception that the enemy has set before us. Now, you may think that sounds a little paranoid, but it sounds no more paranoid than the multiple warnings of Scripture, many of them given by the Lord Himself and given here by the Apostle Paul in verse 9. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Well, that's the before picture. You got the picture? The wicked. But now let's look at the after picture. We go from the wicked to the second category, the washed, in verse 11, and this, that is what some of you were, but you were washed. From wicked to washed, from immoral to moral, from sinner to saint. This is, uh, this is no small matter. This is transformation. This is conversion. This is a changed heart, a changed life. This is becoming a new creation in Christ. This is a new life with new values and a new Lord and a new power. This is not going to church and calling yourself a Christian and living the way you used to live. This is not Christianity light, although that's where many people want to live. Nothing too radical here. After all, we wouldn't want to stand out. We wouldn't want to be different. We wouldn't want to be weird. 
We wouldn't want to do anything that wouldn't fit in with man's wisdom or meet with man's approval. So celebrities and athletes and now Christian artists can talk about their Christian faith without having any evidence for being one. What you were, you still are. Jesus gets a polite nod and a courteous acknowledgement, but in no way is Jesus Lord. If you think the only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that a Christian goes to church and a Christian prays at mealtime, you have no idea what you are missing in your understanding of Christianity. A Christian has a real 24-hour, seven-day-a-week relationship with the living Lord. A Christian has a new lifeline to the Word of God, the wisdom of God. A Christian has a whole new paradigm, a whole new set of morals and values. A Christian has the reality of abundant life in him and eternal life before him. Oh, the Christian has the operating dynamic of faith and love and hope. A Christian is a new creation. And old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. A Christian is not all that he's going to be, but thank God he's not what he was. Such were some of you. The Christian owes no one an apology for his beliefs. He humbly and thankfully and joyfully aligns himself with the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the world. Now, that doesn't mean that the Christian is perfect. There's a teaching in the church of sinless perfection, but most, most people can see past that and through that, sinless perfection. It doesn't mean we constantly strive to please the Lord. It doesn't mean that we, we don't do everything within us to yield ourselves to His Lordship. But i got to tell you, I've lived for 71 years. I've met hundreds and thousands of Christians, and I've never met one that was perfect, never one. I met some who thought they were, but that only added to their imperfections. <laughs> there are no perfect people. There is one, only one. He's in heaven now. Paul said of the washed ones, such were some of you. And the conversion is obvious. The change is dramatic, but still doesn't mean they were perfect. In fact, if they were perfect, Paul would never have written 1 Corinthians because he wrote 1 Corinthians to address the sins and the shortcomings of the people in the church at Corinth. In fact, that's why Paul wrote much of the New Testament. In Corinth, they were suffering under bad theology, and Paul writes to correct their heretical beliefs. They were suing one another, these Christians, taking one another to court and suing their pants off or their robes or their sandals or whatever they wore. They were abusing spiritual gifts. They were neglecting the poor and the hungry right in their midst. They were a mess, sort of like you and me today. They were such a mess, Paul wrote 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians, and that wasn't enough, so he wrote 2 Corinthians. So we're not perfect, and I'm, frankly, I'm a little weary of the world requiring that of us. No, we're not perfect but we're not what we were. Such were some of you. And if you don't like where I'm at in life, you should have seen me a while back. Can I just testify for a little bit here? You know, I've done some really stupid things in my life. I mean, inexplicable, really stupid things. I bought a 
little red sports car one time without telling my wife beforehand. <laughs> Stupid boy, you. <laughs> Let me tell you, gentlemen, don't ever do that, okay? I mean, my wife was upset with me. I don't need your wife to be upset with me, so don't ever do that. Don't say I'm doing it because Pastor Hawkins did it, and he got away with it. I didn't get away with it. When I was half the age I am now, I was driving from Sioux City to Minneapolis, and I was just outside of Sibley, Iowa. I don't know, Sibley, Iowa. How many people live in Sibley, Iowa? Three? <laughs> Who would have thought there would have been a state patrol car <laughs> parked outside Sibley, Iowa. And I got a speeding ticket. The next day, coming back from Minneapolis, <laughs> you're getting ahead of me, but you're right. Coming back from Minneapolis to Sioux City, I got another one in the same spot. <laughs> I don't like to degrade myself, but folks, there's no other name for this. Stupid! <laughs> and Carolyn didn't speak to me for two days. <laughs> I didn't speak to myself for two days. <laughs> nope, I'm not talking to you. I'm not done yet. Oh, there's more. We don't have time for all of it. I'll never forget the moment, and I can take you to the spot where I did it not terribly long ago. I'm at an age I should know better, but I'm stupid. I asked the lady when her baby was due, uh, a non, non-pregnant non lady. Yeah, that was pretty much the reaction she had. I've done some stupid things. I lived in West Virginia for 10 years. Let me tell you how smart I am, okay? I got a Mother's Day card for Carolyn. I mean beautiful. A be perfect card. I found it. I was so happy about it. It had everything a woman would want. It was pink. It had flowers on it and glitter. I was really excited about the glitter part. Plus, it had a mushy verse on the front of it. And I went in and I bought that card. I, th I bet I was the first guy in this area that bought a Mother's Day card for his wife this year. I, I bought it early, well before Mother's Day. And I was so proud of myself for being so prompt and proactive. And I can still remember taking that card, hiding it, sneaking it into the house. And I remember finding the perfect place to hide it. I hid it there, and I was patting myself on the back, and I remember thinking, <laughs> she'll never, never find it here. I hid it so well that I've not been able to find it myself. <laughs> I have no idea where that card is, that beautiful, expensive card. It's somewhere in that house shedding its glitter as I speak this morning. <laughs> Brilliant! Carolyn's been writing large S's on my T-shirts lately. And uh, I thought it meant Superman, but I think now I know better. <laughs> and you think you know, but you don't. No, that S, that S means smart. Because I've done some really smart things in my life. I married that girl back there 51 years ago. Brilliant. And after marrying her, I came to Iowa. Smart. A few years ago, I moved back to Iowa. See how smart I am? Plus, here's the big part. I've learned from my mistakes. I haven't had a speeding ticket since except for that speed camera in Windsor Heights. 
but that doesn't count. The smartest thing, though, the smartest thing I have ever done was when I was 17 years old, and I had no idea how smart I was being. I had no idea how deep and far-reaching the impact of this smartest of all decisions would be. The smartest thing I've ever done in my life was when I traded in the wisdom of the world for the wisdom of God. It was when I walked down a sawdust trail in a Baptist tent meeting and I repented of my sins and turned my life over to Jesus Christ and I made Him the Lord of my life. And you may be here today and you're saying, you know, I'd like to do that. But I'm, I'm afraid it wouldn't last. I'm afraid I won't stay with it. Well, you know, the night I made that decision, I had the same fear. But I didn't know then what I know now and what I'm about to tell you. You see, this is God's work. Just let him have his way. Who washed these people? God did. Who sanctified them? God did. Who justified them? God did. Note verse 11 one more time. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This all takes place under the guidance of and by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of the living God. The wicked and the washed. Would you like to be washed today? Isn't that what your heart cries out for? One college student, when receiving Christ, said, I can't explain it. it it's like someone took a six-foot toothbrush and washed me on the inside. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Holy God, I thank you for that kind of grace, the grace that reaches down so low, the lowest of the low, the grace that is extended while we were yet sinners, God commended His love toward us. The grace that is able to save to the uttermost. The grace, that unmerited favor of God that comes and washes us when we could never wash ourselves. That grace that justified us that gave us a righteous position before the Lord that we could never earn. The grace that continues to work in our lives to sanctify us, to cleanse us, to conform us into the image of your Son. That grace that is always sufficient, always undeserved. The inexhaustible, undeserved, unmerited grace of God I thank you, Lord, that I found that grace at 17 years of age, and now I find it to be every bit as alive and vital and powerful and efficacious, transforming, renewing. And 
Father, I pray that if there are those here this morning that, that ache, their heart yearns, they cry, but they've not quite known where to take the cry, what to do with the yearning deep within, this morning I pray that they'll find exactly what they need in Christ today. They'll experience the washing, the cleansing, the right standing that He and only He can bring. Let that person know this morning that if they make that commitment to you, Lord, that they're surrounded by hundreds of others in this building alone who have made the same commitment, who have the joy unspeakable and the peace that passes all understanding because of it. Dear church, will you stand with me? Pastor Brett's going to lead us. And, and as he leads us in this beautiful and appropriate song, the song that echoes the message of the message, maybe today is your day. In fact, God says it is. He says today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Not tomorrow, today. And I invite you to step out where you are. Just come and kneel at this altar and say, Lord, be my Lord. Wash me. Wash me. And I will be clean.